weapon. Oh, thank you. Should I sit here? No, you sit here. Sorry, you're the lady. I can be here. I'm old fashioned. Oh. Hi. Kind of weird to be up here again, but we can do it. There's a reason this stage extension is here. The Oregon Symphony tonight is doing something extremely unusual, and we'll be talking about that. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland. I even remembered to bring my name tag tonight. Oh, yeah, thank you for doing that. Which I never remember. I don't know why somehow I remember tonight. Sure, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. We really enjoy these events, Carlos and I and all the conductors and members of the orchestra who get to come out here and and get a sense of who comes to the concerts. And I can tell you, speaking for any radio engineer being, a uh, radio announcer being able to talk to an audience, you can see is a special and unusual experience. So thank you for being here. Mm. So you know that guy over there probably, that's Carlos Calmar, he's the music director of the Oregon Symphony. <laughs> Good evening. Conducts, stuff like that. This woman you may never have seen before. Her name is Tipika Gua. She is a playwright. And this is, as far as I know, the first time an orchestra has commissioned a play as part of a concert. Is that true? So, yeah. I, so yeah. I hear. I don't yes. Know. Yeah, you were surprised, right? I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are writing history again here in Portland, Oregon. So it's a play whoever, called... For whoever was here last week, we wrote history by premiere, well, doing the world premiere of a piece by Mark Anthony Turnage. And tonight we thought, ah, oh, come on. You are all accustomed to world premieres by the Oregon Symphony, which will be here in terms of the music by Chris Rogerson, which is wonderful, but we thought let's do it more in a more complex way, given the topic that we are trying to tackle, and we ask Deepika. This is the first event this season. Last season, you had a series of unusual events with themes and dealing with things that were beyond just playing the notes on the page. This season, you're taking that idea even farther um, and including commissioning a play called Azan, which is the Muslim call to prayer. Anybody ever actually heard that singing anywhere? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, Especially at three o'clock in the morning when you're trying to sleep. But yeah. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, and it comes wafting in your hotel room and you're traveling in somewhere. Oh, it's just great. So. When did you get the request to write this? How long ago? April of this year. <laughs> Not very long. And what, Not very long ago. What were the rules in terms of how many actors, the subject, the length? I had some guidelines. Uh, Charles Carmer, who spoke to me, said he, would, he, he wanted it to be under 30, minute, 30 minutes and would like a um, few actors. So <laughs> three or four, he said. And look at their pictures in the program. This is an incredibly handsome group of actors. So you got to get together for a group photo when this is over. Yeah, they come that way, actors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them you went to grad school with, so that's fun. And then the others you haven't worked with before. So, Carlos, what about the theme of the play? Was that specified? Of course it was. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, we came up with this, uh, we wanted this year uh, with the series The Sounds of Home to create something that tackles actually uh, social themes, themes in a concert setting that are relevant to society. And uh, quite a while ago, we came up with three themes, which are immigration, environment, and homelessness. And just so we can get, because everybody, I, I know this, <laughs> you all look at me, and later when we have the large crowd, everybody was, will look at Scott, at me, etc., and we'll look. So let's, can I get the elephant out of the room that everybody think, oh, immigration, they are thinking about the elephant. No elephant. There, there is no elephant because actually our, when we um, decided to do this, it was long before anything happened that happens these days in several countries in the world that was immigration relevant. Because we thought, immigration is a big, big topic, that um, this is a topic of in our society that is 
difficult to tackle and it was difficult to tackle for an enormously long time and uh, you see actually two immigrants in front of you who probably each of us has a very particular story to tell about that in terms of own stories and the theme will be here when we leave the concert hall and probably in 10 years it still will be there so that's why this is not about any elephants most humans are immigrants most of i mean if you look back at our heritage most people came from somewhere else i was amazed to learn that the finnish and hungarian languages are closely related and they're not related to any other languages so at some time way back in the past there was a split there and some people went way up north Dipka, you're from Calcutta. Tell us about your growing up and your own personal immigrant experience well, in I, 25 minutes or less. Uh, I know, how much time do you have? <laughs> exactly. About that. Yeah, about that. Um, well, my grandparents uh, were casualties of the partition of India in 1947 when the country gained independence, crossed over from Bangladesh, both sets of grandparents and were settled in a refugee colony in Delhi. And that's where my parents grew up, and they grew up uh, Indian, but we're, of course, Bengali. Um, and then I grew up partly in the south of India, partly in England, partly in Russia. And then in my late teens, we moved back to England where I went to school and went to college, and then I moved to America 10 years ago. Um, so that sort of immigration in recent memory, but as you say, it, it probably goes back a lot longer than that. How long have you been writing? Uh, about 10 years. What got you started? Um, immigrating. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had to leave home to find out who I was. And um, that process, I think perhaps for a lot of writers, that process of severing in a sense, from where, where you come from, gives you a kind of perspective and a kind of uh, ownership over your experience, which is certainly how I came uh, to writing. You are so well-spoken, I can't wait to hear your words come off the page in the mouths of other actors. Carlos, do you want to talk briefly, before we get into the story of the play, about your personal immigrant experience, your family? Well, I am the son of immigrants who had to, my, my parents were from Vienna in Austria. Uh, they had to leave 1938 because of the Nazi regime, uh, Jewish. And uh, they ended up, they didn't know each other. My mother actually was 10 years old in 1938. And they ended up in La Paz, Bolivia of all places, which the only reason to go there was because Bolivia simply opened the gates and allowed uh, a certain contingent of immigrants into their country because their uh, governor at that time had um, ties uh, to, to Europe. Um, other than that, my, my parents actually would have gone anywhere. I mean, when you actually run from somewhere and all you have is uh, what you're wearing and you run because otherwise you're going to die, it's kind of difficult. My parents later met in Bolivia, married, immigrated to Montevideo in Uruguay, where my brother and I were born. Fifteen years after I was born, we moved to Europe. Coincidence, we moved to Vienna in Austria. <laughs> Which, it's a coincidence, but I don't want to make the story too long. Um, in, in, in Austria, my parents uh, spent the remainder of their life, and I spent 38 years there, um, studied, uh, and then I came to the United States, and I'm a resident of Portland, have two Portland children. <laughs> and he's pretty happy, you can tell. He's pretty happy about that. So we'll hear two works for piano and orchestra tonight by Schoenberg and Gershwin, who were friends in Los Angeles. They played tennis together, painted portraits of each other, which I just love. Uh, Gershwin had a hard time getting respect from the classical music establishment because he was a Jewish kid from the Lower East Side. He was a song plugger. 
but immensely talented. Schoenberg left Europe for the same reason so many people did, what Carlos was just talking about. The persecution, he ended up in, in LA and, and was a teacher there. So many stories about immigration and <laughs> I'm reminded of one that Zubin Mehta, who has done a lot of conducting in Israel, uh, Khrushchev or somebody, it's one of those Russian guys back then, uh, was in Israel and Zubin Mehta said to him, thank you for sending us so many wonderful violinists. <laughs> Ooh. I'm glad he said that. It was a good thing. Yeah, so let's get to this, this play. So it, the title refers to the Muslim call to prayer. Will we hear that call to prayer? No, you won't. No, the, um, uh, it isn't a central conceit of the play, but uh, um, the inciting incident that sets the play off in a way um, happens during, the moment, um, during a moment of prayer. Now, the music by Chris Rogerson, did he, he knew what he was writing around and for, right? Yes, he did. Okay, so how do you feel, how do you feel, his music illustrates, reinforces, works with the play? Well, I, actually, I don't want to reveal too many things about what you're going to see and hear, uh, because I... I actually think that everything is self-explanatory. Um, the music does two things incredibly well. Uh, it continues and sometimes sets the tone for either commenting something that just happened on stage or uh, kicking off something that will be talked about. And then, uh, be because although I don't know how many times Deepika and Chris worked together, but it seems to me that the work together uh, paid off tremendously because sometimes uh, both artists, Deepika and Chris, allow each other to kind of take off. Some, so sometimes you will hear just the play, and sometimes uh, intentionally, I would say, Deepika takes a step back and you just hear music that takes you places that, I would say, that play insinuates very well. Is this like, say, Edvard Grieg's incidental music for Pierre Gint? Did that function in the same way? Did you think about... This is incidental music. This is not incidental music. Uh -huh. No, it's not. Um, uh, uh, Charles's uh, kind of invitation to me was to find a way to use the orchestra as it, bake it into the conceit of the play and make, you know, so that it's truly necessary for the telling of the story. So that's something that I was thinking about a lot when I was thinking about what I would write about. Um, was that new to you? Yes. I mean, who, when do you get told that you have an orchestra to your disposal? When you when actually you're... write an opera. Oh. <laughs> hey. Only time. Are you inviting hey, me to write an there's an idea. <laughs> an opera on immigration. You an could take this story, flesh it out. We also knew the actors wouldn't be singing, so um, it's not a libretto, it's still a, a play, so there's scene work and there's music and I think that um, that's such a beautiful way you described Chris's work. Um, um, we actually, I wrote the play, I read it out loud to him on the phone. I live in LA, he lives in New York and we just read the play together and then he had time to himself and he would come back with pieces of music and then I would read it out loud and hear what he was playing on the piano through Skype, sometimes painfully, feedback. Um, and that's, that's how we built it. Aren't you glad you came to this? I mean, I find this so interesting, the way people collaborate, the, the creative things that creative people do, and the way they use the technology that we have today. Just one word uh, about, because you asked about incidental music. Usually incidental music works the way uh, that there is a piece of theater and the piece is done. This is how the piece of theater is. And then a composer is being asked, 
Can you write something that goes in between the acts, in between the scenes? That's incidental music. And that's why uh, this is not incidental music, because it's, it's a work in progress where two artists in very different art forms relate to each other and create something that you're going to see. Lucky us. Now, do you want to talk about the story, or should we just experience that as it happens? Um, I think you should probably experience it as it happens since you're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Well, the, um, it, it, I, I don't want to talk about uh, the story itself. The great thing about, and uh, I apologize if you hear me repeat it later, I don't know what I'm going to say from the stage when I take it uh, to start the concert, but what I think is so great about what you're going to experience tonight is, first of all, you're going to hear an incredibly adventuring music that is so insanely diverse. You have a world premiere by an American composer, and then you have a Russian composer on Hebrew themes that reminds, will remind you undoubtedly of klezmer music. Uh, you have uh, the piano concerto by Arnold Schoenberg, which I think will be astonishing to listen to because, uh, I mean, we are now used, to, uh, whenever we say, you are going to hear Arnold Schoenberg, you're like, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. well, just wait. I don't, I don't react that way, but. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it can happen. Um, <laughs> and, and the language of Schoenberg in this is very Austrian. I mean, specifically, I, I hear all these waltzes and this kind of sarcasm that is so typical of the Austrians sometimes. And then you have George Gershwin, which, funny enough, is kind of another uh, national anthem of the United States, written by a Jew whose parents came from the pogroms, fleeing the pogroms. It's kind of a funny story. And the great thing is, all together, gives you an impression of what immigration actually, how important immigration actually is. Because, uh, let alone the fact that I turn to you, I look at you and I think, uh, I'm not asking the question, but I'm sure if I ask you, please raise your hand if you're an immigrant. At least you are your parents, where probably half of you will raise their hands. Tonight you hear music, uh, f three out of four, four composers are immigrants. The writer is an immigrant. The pianist is an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. On stage, there are immigrants, and yeah, and we are here in America. And that's a good thing. Yeah. So many issues to talk about, so many different ways we could <laughs> approach this. I'm curious about your response to music in general and how familiar you are with these things. I, I'm sure you know Rhapsody in Blue. You ever heard the Schoenberg Piano Concerto? Never in my life, no. Oh, there's a fun mo moment in this concerto. Uh, it's in four movements, they flow together. There's no space between them. The transition between the third movement, which is very serious, and the last movement, which is m more fun, is absolutely delightful. It's this piano solo that kind of reminds me of Petrushka. It just totally changes the mood of the piece, and then the orchestra goes, yeah, let's go there, and then they all take off together. It's really fun. And then, you know, Rhapsody in Blue is awesome. What music do you love? What do you listen to? Do you play an instrument? Do you sing? No, not, not remotely musical, but I do, I do think of plays as music in a, in a I'm not musical in a tr traditional way, but um, I do think of language uh, as a kind of music and what the the rhythm of a scene is, I think, informs the nature of the scene. But of course, language is not nearly a third as emotional as music. So it's a great luxury to be in this, in this space. Um, and one thing that we, Chris and I talked a lot about was not doubling up on either information or emotional energy, that we did know that the words needed to function differently from the music. 
And um, we were quite consciously trying to mold that shape so you weren't um, accosted twice by, if you're hearing it in the words, you don't want to hear it in the music. That's brilliant. You, you want to feel the music and receive something else um, in your mind. And um, as a playwright, that um, jump between abstraction uh, and, and music as an abstract form, um, kind of that juxtaposition of abstraction and representationalness or, or literalness is something that I think about a lot. Like, when do you, when do we need to understand something um, and when do we benefit from just having an impression of a pattern? Um, and music does one. Music can kind of give you a sense of pattern and a sense of emotion um, much better than language can. So that was teach? a big part of the conversation. When they let me, sometimes. Who's they? <laughs> I mean, you should teach. You, you're wonderful in expressing. Do you? you? Uh, occasionally. A little. Occasionally, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, the thing is actually, I, I'm interested in what Deepika just said because I actually think that what comes out of your play is highly emotional. The only thing that I, without revealing anything, <laughs> I think is, is a great idea is that, uh, I don't know how you say this technically in English, but sometimes, because it's very serious what you write, and sometimes you just break it. At least in German, we would say you break it because there are two lines that are funny. Oh. And boom, and like, and then you continue on your journey and, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, I think I count, can count it in terms of doubling the emotions. Uh, I think even I can count it somehow on, with two fingers, moments when language and music actually really have to meet very specifically at some point because then something is going on or something is being alluded by what Deepika writes and it's kind of demonstrated through music. Other than that, it's art forms that are working just very well together. How did the Oregon Symphony know about Deepika Gua? That actually, I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, the thing is this, this is an adventure for us at the Oregon Symphony too. When it comes to commission pieces by composers, uh, you ask Charles, our artistic administrator, you ask me, and we will tell you da 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 da, -da all these names. This is foreign country for us, so, we are like appropriate. Then, yeah, then we'll yeah, <laughs> and then we think we need a brilliant playwright. I have no idea who that is. And, and a living playwright. So. <laughs> <laughs> and a willing playwright. Willing, willing playwright. Yeah. So, um, uh, I asked you a little bit about music. What about playwrights? Favorites, names, drop names, or or plays you love, or were influential on you? So many. Um, Paula Vogel. Nilo Cruz, Maria Irene Fornes, Chiara Hudez, these are all American playwrights, Samuel Beckett, um, uh, so, so, so many, more than, more than I can name, Rajiv Joseph. Um, there's, uh, there's so many wonderful playwrights working in the United States right now, it's, it's really great. But um, when I got this gig, um, I asked what else I could read and Charles said um, there was only one play in existence w written with an orchestra in mind. And I said, who is it? And he said, Tom Stoppard um, uh, yeah. and Andre Previn, and which is not at all intimidating uh, <laughs> to look at. So I read that one thing um, and it holds up, which is, which is nice. So they could just have done that, but I'm very glad that they, they took a chance on a, on a we living, actually, living playwright. You, no, we thought about that. You but did. <laughs> we thought about that, but then we thought, no, actually, we want to create something new, um, and therefore we go hunt. And I'm very, very grateful that you are here and did this for yeah. us. And, and this has got to get a lot of press in the orchestra world. And I hope in the theater world 
as well. Well, you never can control because uh, on our day and age, unfortunately, the written press is fairly limited, as you know. And uh, um, uh, people who have reviewed um, also bigger orchestras and probably theater companies in the past are now out of work or you have to go into the internet. I mean, New York Times, etc., the Oregonian, that doesn't, re unfortunately, doesn't really happen. It's word of mouth somehow. Uh, the one thing I know is that leading to this event for the last six months or even nine months, once we published what we are doing this season and once this project uh, was published, other orchestras said uh, to us, you are doing what? Wow! And I thought, yeah, see, it's Portland, Oregon. We are in the lead. <laughs> it's one of the reasons we live here, kids. <laughs> this is the most unusual concert I've ever attended by the Oregon Symphony. It may be for yes. you too, and it's just gonna be wonderful. So glad you're here. And just to remind you who's who, that's Carlos Calmar. This is Divika Gua, the playwright of Azan, the play we're going to hear tonight. And if you're inspired to get music on the way out, there's a table in the lobby covered with CDs, and you could actually, you know, buy one. And this is Robert McBride. Thanks for being here. Thank you.